Hello, this is Mr. Norby, and today we want to discuss viruses. In our last presentation, we looked at the characteristics that all living things have in common. And at the end of that discussion, we asked the question, should a virus be considered a living thing or a non-living thing? Our learning objectives for today, first we want to identify the kingdoms of life, we want to explain a model for the structure of a virus, Want to explain how viruses reproduce. We want to describe what happens after a virus infects a cell. We want to explain how viruses cause disease. We want to clarify whether a virus is living or non-living. And so let's start with a dis the kingdoms of life. Most scientists break life into classification schemes with the largest scheme being the kingdom. And most scientists agree that there are five kingdoms. There are people who will debate that bacterium should be separated into two distinct kingdoms. Um, I'm a traditionalist, so I like to go with a five kingdom system. I think it's a little bit easier and, and it's not worth splitting hairs over. Um, the first kingdom are the Monera, which are the bacterium. And if you remember, these are all prokaryotic organisms. They're simple organisms, they're small, they have, they're single-celled, they have a membrane, they have some cytoplasm, some genetic material, and some chemicals like ribosomes to help build proteins, but there's not much to them. If you are a six kingdom person, you could separate bacteria into archaebacteria and eubacteria. Archaebacteria are the type of bacteria that live in extreme environments like hot springs and at the bottom of the ocean near hydrothermal vents. They use heat energy to convert chemicals into carbohydrates for their own energy. Eubacteria are the other types of bacteria that work on normal processes of converting chemicals into carbohydrates. All the other kingdoms are what we call eukaryotes. And these are made up of cells that have very clear membrane-bound organelles, a very distinct nucleus. They are much larger and considered much more advanced organisms. Grouping them further, the protista or the protus were first identified as a member of a kingdom uh, identified by Anton van Leeuwenhoek when he was looking at pond water and found these little creatures swimming around in the pond. And if you remember, we, he described them as wee little beasties or animacules. Fungi are also a kingdom, and they include things like mushrooms, which most of these uh, members of our types of life are decomposers. They get their energy by breaking down uh, organic material. Plants are part of another kingdom, and these plants typically are, they, they all have chloroplasts and are capable of a process we talked about earlier called photosynthesis, where we use the energy of light to convert chemicals into carbohydrates. And finally, we have animals, which are what you and I belong into, um, and we need to get our energy from eating green plants or fungi or something like that. The discovery of viruses happened a little over 100 years ago, about 130 years ago, um, and our understanding of viruses is growing every day. In fact, it's growing a lot right now because people are rapidly trying to understand them more so now than ever before. But it started in 1892. When Dmitry Ivanovsky was working with a thing called the tobacco mosaic virus. And basically, this was a disease that was killing tobacco plants. And what he found was when he ground up some of these plants that had this disease and created a juice extract of that, and then put it on the uh, cells or on the leaves of healthy tobacco plants, they started to get sick with this disease and die. The next person was Martinez Bernacek, who coined the term virus when he was trying to understand this tobacco mosaic virus. And he said that there's some type of poison involved in this, and we'll call this a virus. Finally, an American biochemist by the name of Wendell Stanley isolated crystals 
that were part of the tobacco mosaic virus. And these crystals obviously weren't a, a living part of the cell because they didn't have any membrane or anything that cells typically have. And so we knew that this was something that was of interest and something that we needed to find more about. So if you look at the structure of viruses, viruses basically have two to three different parts. They have a protein coating called a capsid, and then they have some genetic material. Now that genetic material can be some type of nucleic acid, whether it be DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, or RNA, ribonucleic acid. Um, some bacteria around the capsid also have a lipid type of membrane coating. But for the most part, this T4 bacteriophage here shows the capsid, which has all the little proteins on the outside, the DNA in the middle. Um, we have this rod-shaped tobacco mosaic virus, which takes a little bit different shape. It's an RNA type of virus. We also have the influenza virus, which are family of viruses, which are another RNA virus. And these are more spherical in shape. And if you notice, these viruses are really small. In fact, they're so small you can only see them with an electron microscope. And these pictures at the bottom um, show actual images of viruses taken on an electron microscope. They're colorized, but that's a computer enhancement because remember electron microscopes only produce images that are black and white. So let's look at viral reproduction. A virus basically needs a host. It can't reproduce without it. And because it harms the host most of the time, it's considered a parasite. Now, the fact that living things, one of the characteristics of all living things is that they are capable of reproduction or have come about as a part of reproduction, leaves this question, is a virus living or non-living? Yes, reproduction is involved, but the virus is not the one reproducing itself. It needs something to help it along the way. But the people who will argue that viruses are a living thing will say, you see, they're capable of reproducing, but not really because they don't do it on their own. <clears throat> How do viruses work? Well, a virus is very similar to a computer virus. In fact, the term computer virus was generated when people started hacking computers and it was attacking computers very similarly to the way biological viruses would attack cells. And basically there's some type of a virus of any type, whether it be a computer or a um, biological virus, have some type of code. In the case of the computer virus, it's a computer code. In a biological virus, it's a type of nucleic acid code, whether it be DNA or RNA. It gets introduced into the host. In a computer, it's introduced by either a spam or an email attachment or some nefarious website that you open up. In the case of a biological virus, the virus attacks the cell, introduces, infects the cell with its code. Once that's in to the computer or into the cell, that code is copied, the instructions are carried out, and new viruses are released into the environment whenever possible. If you look at viral infections, there's two basic types. Lytic infections are viral infections that happen over a short period of time in a matter of a few days or weeks. Lysogenic viral infections are ones that take longer to manifest themselves. So let's look at both of those in a little more detail. Lytic infections start when the virus infects the DNA of a bacterium or any type of cell for that matter, it introduces its genetic material into the host. That genetic material then starts doing what it's supposed to do. It uses the ribosomes to make proteins. It uses the uh, cell's genetic material to reproduce its nucleic acid code. It then constructs the viruses. The viruses build up to the point where they start uh, altering the cell's ability to function properly, and they get so overcrowded the virus eventually causes the cell to burst, or what they call lice, and that releases new viruses into the environment. Lysogenic infections start with that same infecting process, but then that DNA that gets into the cell, or the RNA that gets into the cell, 
manifests itself into the DNA of the cell itself, of its host, and forms what we call a prophage. Now, once that's into the genetic material, the bacterium or the uh, cell, whatever it may be, does its normal cellular processes of copying the DNA through replication, of dividing into new cells, and this process can continue for several generations before eventually it enters the lytic phase in which the virus is released into the new environment and or into the environment and the infection continues. Now let's look at a couple common types of viral infections. An RNA virus, like the common cold, is one that happens relatively quickly where this genetic material is introduced into the cell. The cell makes all of the viral parts. They're restructured into the virus itself. And then the cells release those viruses into the environment when they burst and cause the cell to a retrovirus like HIV um, is a little bit different in that it gets into the cell and that RNA inserts itself into the DNA and makes it becomes part of that cell's own DNA. And again, this is more lysogenic in nature in that this can go on for many years with not some disruption, but not serious disruption before it enters the lytic phase. But once it enters the lytic phase, then um, the virus changes into a much more serious condition we call AIDS. If we look at common human viral diseases, and I'm not going to insult your intelligence, I'll let you take in and pause this uh, presentation. You can read this as you want. But the thing I want you to pay attention to is on the very far left, you have some common viruses, things like the cold, common cold, influenza, AIDS, and HIV, hepatitis, West Nile, Ebola, Zika. It tells you which part of the body is affected. Um, for example, the common cold um, affects your respiratory system and then is transmitted through contacts of objects and droplets and things like that. This is what we're concerned about with um, our current COVID-19 virus. But other viruses are transmitted in slightly different forms. Zika, for example, is in, uh, transmitted through the bites of mosquitoes. Um, HIV is through blood and sexual contact and different things like that. The corona virus is a part of lots of different corona family of viruses. Um, this one's just kind of the most recent manifestation of it. And these coronaviruses or RNA viruses, and the concern we have with RNA viruses is that they mutate every year and are changing all the time and evolving all the time. And that's why for things like the flu, every year you have to get a new flu shot because the virus has evolved and it's manifest itself into a little bit different strain or different form. And every year, scientists are actively working to try to anticipate what this virus, this new type of flu or, or infection could be. And they make vaccinations, which basically allow your immune system to remember this infection because it's similar genetically to something that's serious. And if you remember your immune system works in three ways. It has to identify the infector, it has to defeat the infector, it has to remember the infector. And, and vaccinations are a part of the remembering and defeating part of this situation. The problem with the COVID-19 virus right now is we don't have any vaccination for it. And we could have a whole big long discussion on vaccinations and the, the junk science out there that people believe and that vaccines cause all kinds of problems for developing children. Um, but I think right now that those myths are being put to the test really hard and hopefully people will start looking at the real science behind viruses and vaccinations. So finally, is a virus living or not? If you compare a virus and what it does to a cell in terms of the characteristics of living things, Structure of a virus is some genetic material and a capsid. A cell has a membrane, cytoplasm, 
organelles, all kinds of things like that. In its ability to reproduce, a virus needs a host. A cell can reproduce independently, either sexually or asexually. In terms of genetic code, viruses can be both DNA and RNA. Cells are just DNA. In terms of growth and development, Viruses don't really have a life cycle of growth and development like we think of in terms of a cellular organism, where they increase in size and number and differentiate and different things like that. And the ability to obtain and use energy, viruses do not do that, but a cell absolutely needs to. Can viruses respond to their environment? No, they're basically um, at the mercy of the environment, where a cell can respond to environmental signals. Can they change over time? Absolutely. Both cells and viruses can change over time. And this we know is called evolution. So in future lectures, we're going to talk about what is evolution, what causes things to change over time, and, and how that process works. Thank you for listening. Enjoy your day.